Good evening, and welcome to the University of Chicago's 26th annual Martin Luther King Commemoration Celebration. My name is Stephanie Green. I'm a third year in the college and currently serving as president of the Organization of Black Students. It is with great honor that I stand before you in the very chapel where 60 years ago, Martin Luther King delivered his first major address in Chicago. His decision to speak at Rockefeller was a demonstration of his affinity for students and his belief in the power of ideas. It was, it was also an acknowledgement that institutions like the University of Chicago have a responsibility to support its students and young leaders' efforts to have positive impacts on our communities. The theme of this year's celebration, as thought of by the Black Student Association at the Lab School, is history, hope, and responsibility. I cannot think of a more fitting theme as young people across the nation, in Chicago, and right here in Hyde Park, come into their positions as leaders who are charged with shaping communities that are more equitable. As students, not only do we have the opportunity and time to dedicate to incredibly rigorous academic pursuits, but we also have the responsibility and burden to work diligently to influence social changes that benefit generations beyond our own. At the University of Chicago, I have seen students come together across racial, ethnic, and religious lines to offer their shoulders to cry on in the wake of the Chapel Hill shootings. I have seen students stand in protest of the unjust killings of black people at the hands of the state. I have seen students take to the streets to call on the university to open a level one trauma center. And now, I'm happy to say that I've seen those same students celebrate the university's announcement to open a level one trauma center right here on the U Chicago Medical Center campus. I am so proud to say that I attend a university where students are committed to being forces of good. Having had such incredible experiences in my short time here has challenged me to rethink the ways in which we all have roles in creating environments where we allow each other to be welcomed and thrive. As you walked into Rockefeller today, you were handed a change exchange note card. I encourage you to share a quote or story that has shaped or challenged your understanding of history and our collective responsibility to work towards a more equitable society. If you're a young person like me and would rather type something than lay your hands on a finger, you can also participate via social media. The details are in your program. Throughout the night, I challenge you all to think about ways in which you can be an advocate for change in your community. There is a lot to be done, and you are needed in this work. Thank you all, and it is now my pleasure to introduce the Chicago Children's Choir. And please turn to the back of your program and join in the singing of Lift Every Voice and Sing. <laughs> Oh 
Please be seated. Good evening. My name is Carlos Cardenas Iniguez, and I am a doctoral student in the Department of Psychology in the Social Sciences Division. Tonight, I will be reading excerpts from a speech Dr. King gave on April 4th, 1967, entitled, Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break Silence. We are now faced with the fact, my friends, that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. Procrastination is still the thief of time. Life often leaves us standing bare, naked, and dejected with a lost opportunity. The tide in the affairs of men does not remain at flood, it ebbs. We may cry out desperately for time to pause in her passage, but time is adamant to every plea and rushes on. Over the bleached bones and jumbled residues of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words, too late. There is an invisible book of life that faithfully records our vigilance or our neglect. Omar Khayyam is right. The moving finger writes and having writ moves on. We still have a choice today, nonviolent coexistence or violent co-annihilation. We must move past indecision to action. If we do not act, we shall surely be dragged down the long, dark, and shameful corridors of time reserved for those who possess power without compassion, might without morality, and strength without sight. Now let us begin. Now let us rededicate ourselves to the long and bitter, but beautiful, struggle for a new world. This is the calling of the sons of God, and our brothers wait eagerly for our response. Shall we say the odds are too great? Shall we tell them the struggle is too hard? Will our message be that the forces of American life militate against their arrival as full men, and we send our deepest regrets? Or will there be another message? of longing, of hope, of solidarity with their yearnings, of commitment to their cause, whatever the cost? The choice is ours, and though we might prefer it otherwise, we must choose in this crucial moment of human history. As a noble bard of yesterday, James Russell Lowell eloquently stated, once to every man and nation comes a moment to decide in the strife of truth and falsehood for the good or evil side. Some great cause, God's new Messiah, offering each the bloom or blight, and the choice goes by forever twixt that darkness and that light. Though the cause of evil prosper, yet his truth alone is strong, though her portions be the scaffold and upon the throne be wrong, yet that scaffold sways the future and behind the dim unknown, standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. And if we will only make the right choice, 
we will be able to transform this pending cosmic elegy into a creative psalm of peace. If we will make the right choice, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our world into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. If we will, bu if we will but make the right choice, we will be able to speed up the day all over America and all over the world when justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Thank you.
Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, welcome to the University of Chicago's celebration of the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Uh, first, please uh, join me in thanking once again the Chicago Children's Choir Voice of Chicago <laughs> Ensemble. Every year, uh, we gather here in Rockefeller Chapel, the site of Dr. King's first major speech in Chicago, to remember him, his work, what he stood for, and its continued relevance today. Namely, that while we have made very significant strides as a society, the work of creating a more just and equitable society is ongoing. The most important thing to remember Dr. King said that day is that you must keep moving, and that indeed is what we all must do together. Uh, Dr. King was a forceful advocate, not only for rights and freedom, but for the importance of diversity in that context. The diversity that he was so articulate in promoting uh, is in fact central to the University of Chicago's missions of providing an empowering education, producing research of depth, originality, and impact, and to our commitment to being a partner to have a positive impact on the world. Partners from our own community uh, to the city in general and to those around the globe. Uh, diversity is central because the quality of our work depends upon the constant challenge of ideas and understanding issues from multiple perspectives. Now, of course, uh, while Dr. King often spoke of tolerance and the meaning and importance of diversity and tolerance uh, in very broad terms, there was also the very particular history of African Americans in the United States that was critical and, of course, central to driving his work. And as with Dr. King, at the university we must recognize not only the importance of diversity in the broad sense, but in the very responding to this uh, particular history. A number of key features of the university's response to these imperatives of diversity and the history in particular of African Americans in this country have centered around the financial accessibility of the university uh, to families of all financial situations. Uh, we admit students 100% without regard to their ability to pay. Uh, we once admitted we create a financial aid package for them to be able to attend. And recently, we've begun building these packages so they entail no loans, so it is possible for them to graduate debt-free. It ensures meaningful work and internship opportunities, so they'll be able to take full advantage of their educational opportunities here, and at the same time, have access to experiences around the world. Fully 60% of our students are receiving financial aid. Beyond financial matters, which is one issue, but certainly far from the only one, a recently launched Center for Identity and Inclusion provides support for students from diverse backgrounds, and our Center for College Student Success provides support for students from underrepresented groups, including students who may be undocumented. As we announced in November, the University of Chicago is now a member of the Creating Connections Consortium, which provides support for graduate students from underrepresented backgrounds as they complete their studies and transition into academic appointments at higher education institutions. Uh, these are just some of the examples of what we're doing, but even if you put everything that we're doing together, uh, as I indicated when I began, there is much more work to do. And this is work that we all need to participate in, uh, advancing all of these issues as a community and doing it together. Uh, this afternoon, I have the privilege of conferring this year's Diversity Leadership Awards. Uh, these awards recognize university alumni, staff members, and faculty members whose work embodies Dr. King's values and reflect the fact that all members of our community uh, need to be participating in these issues if we are going to make a full progress as a community. Uh, the, and I'd just like to uh, briefly acknowledge them uh, here again uh, this evening because of the importance of their work. The 2016 Diversity Leadership Faculty Award recipient is Nancy Schwartz, uh, Dean and Director for Postdoctoral Affairs in the Biological Science Division and Professor of Pediatrics, Biochemistry, and Molecular Biology. For more than 30 years, 
Nancy's been a leader in the work to increase the diversity of the Biological Sciences Division and the biomedical workforce at large, recruiting students from underrepresented minority groups, leading initiative that, initiatives that provide development opportunities for students and new graduates from underrepresented backgrounds, and acting as a role model to other faculty in diversity initiatives. The recipient of the 2006 Diversity Leadership Alumni Award is Charles Russell Branham, who completed his PhD in history at the University of Chicago in 1981. Charles is the senior historian and African-American expert for the DuSable Museum of African-American History and has been teaching at our laboratory schools for more than 23 years. As an educator, writer, researcher, and expert, Charles has made a substantial effort to bring an African-American presence to American history and to broaden the perspective and knowledge of political leaders, colleagues, and students for the last 40 years. Uh, finally, our recipient for the 2016 Diversity Leadership Staff Award is Denise Jorgens, Director of International House Chicago and President of International Houses Worldwide. Denise has successfully built a space where people of different nationalities and cultures live and learn together in a community of mutual respect and understanding. In addition to engaging with our international alumni and raising awareness of contemporary global issues, Denise co-founded the English, English Language Institute, which provides English as a second language classes to students and members of the wider community. Uh, Nancy Schwartz, Charles Branham, and Denise Jorgens, would you please stand and be recognized? Please. Uh, I'd now like to take a moment to personally welcome our speakers for this evening's ceremony, uh, Dr. Van Jones, Professor Nikki Giovanni, and Professor Theaster Gates. Uh, Van Jones, who is our keynote speaker this evening, is a civil rights leader, former Obama White House advisor, author, and CNN political correspondent, as well as a pioneer in the clean energy economy. Van is the founder of Green for All, the Ella Baker, Cent Baker Center for Human Rights, Color of Change, and Rebuild the Dream. His work centers around promoting a green economy, which will help reduce pollution and bring green jobs to disadvantaged communities. Nikki Giovanni is a world-renowned poet, writer, commentator, activist, and educator, and is the University Distinguished Professor of English at Virginia Tech. Nikki has been a strong voice for the African-American community, as well as a passionate advocate for civil rights and equality. Nikki will join us as our special guest in conversation with the Astor Gates. The Astor Gates is a globally recognized artist, is the director of our Arts and Public Life program, and a professor in our Department of Visual Arts. The Astor has been widely recognized for his ongoing work as a leader in the revitalization and restoration of community arts and culture on Chicago's South Side and the power of that approach to building communities. Uh, Van, Nikki, and The Astor will each be more fully introduced later in the program, but for now, please join me in welcoming them to Rockefeller Chapel and taking part in this evening. And Dr. King uh, believed that, um, and I'm quoting, an individual has not started living fully until they can rise to the broader concerns of humanity. Life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? So as we work to address the complex society, complex problems that society faces, we must all be thinking about ways to make our campus our city, our nation, and our world, a place that respects and supports diversity. It is only in bringing diverse perspectives to bear on these questions themselves that we will make progress toward the future that Dr. King imagined. Welcome once again. Thank you very much.
Good evening. It is my special pleasure and great honor to introduce the poet, activist, professor, and self-described dreamer, Nikki Giovanni. Ms. Giovanni is a poet and writer whose work has been influential across multiple generations for over 40 years. Her writing is grounded in the African-American experience and her own experiences. Her family, growing up in Cincinnati, time with her grandparents in Knoxville, Tennessee, becoming a mother, living and fighting for her community, the lessons of love and relationships, honoring and reflecting on what she has learned from those who have mentored and encouraged her in her writing, and all the music that she has loved. She is a Grammy-nominated artist for a spoken word uh, recording that is really the first rap recording. She is a finalist for the National Book Award and the recipient of over 20-some honorary degrees and awards. She has been awarded an unprecedented seven NAACP Image Awards. Many of you in this audience are undergraduates, and Ms. Giovanni was an honors graduate of Fisk University, which was also her grandfather's alma mater. While there, she attended the first writers' conference at Fisk and met such luminary poets as Dudley Randall, who later founded Broadside Press, Robert Hayden, Melvin Tolson, Margaret Walker, and Leroy Jones, now known as Mary Baraka. If you don't recognize any of those names, look them up. As a student, she edited the student literary journal titled Elan and reestablished the campus chapter of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. After the death of her beloved grandmother, she returned to writing as a refuge and produced most of the poems that would become part of her first book, Black Feeling, Black Talk. She privately published her second book, saying sometimes you have to do what other people won't do for you, Black Judgment, and went on to privately publish one of the first anthologies of poetry by black women. She was a regular on a television program in the late 60s and early 70s called Soul, which promoted black art, culture, and allowed for political expression. The Soul program allowed her to collaborate with many of the popular musical artists and poets of the time. Professor Giovanni's poetry and spoken word recordings reflect her love of music and the very musicality of her own voice and her words. She loves all kinds of music, everything from gospel, R&B, jazz, and hip hop. She has always listened to the melodies and rhythms around her, and this is clear in her work. Her writing has sustained generations of young people across nearly five decades. And those of us, myself included, who grew up memorizing and performing such poems as Ego Tripping and Nikki Rosa, and when we got a little bit older and understood communication, we have been empowered through her words to believe that our history, our communities, our experiences are beautiful, powerful, and that life is fun. Adults have been moved and strengthened by her poetry about motherhood, relationships, writing, the very process of writing, her mentors, the realities of life and reflections on key moments in history as she has lived them and wept over them. Professor Giovanni is now a distinguished university professor at Virginia Tech University where she continues to not only teach and write but listen and engage. She has said of herself, I like to cook, travel, and dream. I'm a writer. I'm happy. And we're so happy to have her here at the University of Chicago. Tonight, joining Professor Giovanni is Professor Theaster Gates, who is Director of Arts and Public Life at the University of Chicago and Professor in the Department of Visual Arts. Theaster Gates has developed an expanded artistic practice that includes space development, object making, performance, and critical engagement with many publics. Professor Gates transforms spaces, institutions, traditions, and perceptions. His training as an urban planner and sculptor and subsequent time spent studying clay have given him keen awareness of the poetics of production and systems of organizing. Playing with these poetic and systematic interests, Professor Gates has assembled gospel choirs, formed temporary unions, and used systems of mass production as a way of underscoring the need that industry has for the body. He has exhibited and performed at the Studio Museum of Harvard in New York, Whitechapel Gallery in London, Punta della Dolgana in Venice, 
Museum of Contemporary Art here in Chicago, the Santa Barbara Museum of Art, and Documenta 13 in Kassel, Germany, among many other places. He is the recent winner of the Arts Mundi Prize, the largest art prize in the United Kingdom, a uh, major honor for contemporary artists, and his work was exhibited in Cardiff, Wales. I invite you to listen in on what is certain to be a fascinating conversation between two groundbreaking artists. I present to you Professor Nikki Giovanni and Professor Theaster Gates. Let's welcome them. So uh, I should say to us all, I'll start with the bad news, which is we have 20 minutes. Um, that there are so many questions that I have for you, Nick, and uh, anyway, we'll jump in. How you doing? <laughs> really good. Yeah. Um, I want to also kind of give it up for um, the Chicago Children's Choir. Thank you guys are <laughs> super sweet. Maybe, maybe that's a good place to start. They, they ended with the song, ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. That's an interesting use of language. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. You know, and, and I know we only have the 20 minutes, but you know, when you think about who we are, and I think it's important, the reason I'm sick of the president, and I am, is that he hasn't, no, let's start with what I'm, I'm, I'm mad at Barack because he hasn't taught anybody anything. And the one thing that we know is whatever happened in Africa, it wasn't just a bunch of white guys coming over there and, and getting a bunch of black guys and bringing them over here. There were other things going on that some were very ugly. We know that some black people sold some black people because we see that today. We see white people selling white people today. We see, uh, what's that boy, uh, 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 Hugh Hefner having underage girls in, 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 in Playboy magazine, in Playboy book, in Playboy clubs, Playboy magazine. We know that Bill Cosby was a fool to go into it. But very few people in this room today can tell me who they were screwing 50 years ago. That's right. You don't remember. You don't remember who screwed you 50 years ago, but that would be another discussion. <laughs> I just thought I'd mention that. What we had was these people coming from Africa. And we had, I always think of it as this woman. What we had was these people knowing when they were captured and put down in, in, in underground, and they were going to be brought out and shipped over and put on a ship. And what they had was nothing. They knew that whatever was could not ever be again. They were not going back to Africa. That, that didn't make sense. Whatever was coming, they were going to have to make an adjustment. You know why I didn't like The Martian, too, by the way, uh, the movie? I just thought I'd mention a few things I didn't like. And I didn't like The Martian. <laughs> I didn't like the Martian because the only logical thing to send a Martian to Mars is a black woman. Because it's the black woman who would get along with whatever lifestyle is there. You know damn well, excuse me, no white guy is going to get along with whatever it is. They're not going to survive. You send, you send somebody like me, I have them all singing or something. We know <laughs> that that woman in that ship seeing the horror, and that's a longer story, but we know that they also did not all speak the same language. Right. So we had this woman who's going to have to find a way to talk to her people. Sure. Your mother is with you today. She's 90-something years old. She had to find a way to talk to your people. And the talk that she used was what you brought to us. Mm -hmm. And they brought that song to America. Right. And whatever it is that we were, we are the first Americans. The other people were Europeans, they were Russians, they were, what is that thing, Germans, they were it Italians, they were British. We were the people who were Americans. And what we did that was so beautiful was that we taught, despite the, the ugliness, we taught these people how to believe in a dream. Yeah. And what we find now in 2016, is that we are beginning to let that dream go. And I think that's a damn shame because if black people let the dream go, America's gone. Yeah. America is nothing if we don't yeah. believe in it. Yeah. You know, in the back, we were just starting to have a conversation with Van about the South, the church, mm -hmm. 
um, rules, they are saying that his, his sons still say, yes, sir, no, ma'am. And I think that there's something, there's a relationship between that song, the South, this moment, these complicated moments where um, there's not only violence against black men by police, but there's also black on black violence. There's something that there's something missing. I would like you to kind of think about that with me. I think a little bit of love is missing, and I think a lot of fear yeah. is missing. I think there's no question about that. But I'm, again, I'm, I'm mad at the president because I don't understand. And I, I don't mean, I, I think Bill Cosby is a fool. So I think the two fools that we're dealing with today are, are Donald Trump and Bill Cosby, just to be clear about that. <laughs> but I think that, that it's strange that somebody could say, 50 years ago, this happened to me. And yet we can't say a couple of months ago, somebody shot mm. an unarmed child and there's nothing we can do about it. Yes. You mean there's, there's no, yes. if nothing else, it's a violation of that child's civil rights. Yes. And we have a president, and I tell you this, we vote on Tuesday. Nobody woke up on Wednesday and said, damn, he's colored. We knew he was colored when we voted for him. So we expected something different to happen. Mm -hmm. And I think that Barack has refused to lead to say that there ought to be something in America that we ought to, uh, we ought to believe in. All we've done now is let a couple of cops, or several cops, mm -hmm. shoot several people. So now you have these men, and I don't blame them, who are going around saying, well, we'll shoot the cops. Where, I'm saying it again. If black people give up on America, there is no America. Yeah. Where will we go if we give up? Nikki, you know, a, a part of, did I just call you Nikki? Yes, yeah, my name. Really just, wow. Really, well, Nikki, Nikki, thank you. Nikki thank you, Nikki you so much. Um, there's a part of this that, that reminds me of, uh, like, this day, uh, a day of black leadership and kind of remembering black leadership. And, and often when I get into the conversations about the politics of leadership, you have the great one hero that is kind of the speaker for the world. You got, you know, but you, you had that now in relationship to things like Black Lives Matter. And I wonder, um, what are your thoughts on a new kind of leadership? Like, I mean, we're cursing one kind of leadership, mm -hmm. but what, are, what do you think are some of the new trajectories of leadership or some of the old ones that we need to remember? Well, there's no way not to be proud of Black Lives Matter. It, it just, it was the right thing at the right time, mm -hmm. in the right place. And I, frankly speaking, uh, no, it was, thank you. I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm basically a fan of Michigan Avenue. When I, when I come in, I have a charge at, at, at Neiman Marcus that I can't use because I, I am honoring Black Lives Matter. I think that the people who have started this have done the right thing, have done a good thing. We were good people too. Martin was a good guy. Shuttlesworth was a good guy. Yeah. What are we going to do without Rosa Parks? And I know that yeah. I'm a member of Delta Sigma Theta, so I'm going to be, uh, <laughs> 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 but where would we be without the Deltas? Because the Deltas are the ones, <laughs> we were the ones who That's marched right. and we were the ones who said we, women should vote. Even though we were segregated, we marched. And it's important that we look at all of those people, and it's important that we go forward. I think, again, that sometimes the younger people, I'm not picking on Barack, but sometimes they just don't understand what we did, that path that was laid. And so they don't appreciate how we got to where we are. But we, we've done a good job. Yeah. You know, there's, we, we had mentioned also this, um, the phrase, I can't breathe, mm -hmm. right? And, and part of, Part of what that reminds me of is that there's a way in which there's a kind of artistic practice that, in, a, in addition to the political, there's a way in which how do you make the political manifest itself? And one of the ways is through the word, is through word and, and through the arts. And um, there's been a long, you, you've had a, a long history of kind of thinking about the relationship between politics and words. Um, uh, I can't breathe was one of the things that you referenced. And I, I just wanted you to kind of like, Riff on that a little bit. Oh, yeah. well, first of all, you have to really, you just have to love the fact that it has been words that have carried us this far. Yes. And it's going to be words, it's going to be the music that's going to continue to carry us forward. Yes. If Martin yes. were here with us, he would say, also a belief in God. I got nothing against God, but God doesn't exist unless we have a word for him. Am I making yeah, sense? Yeah. And so we created yeah. God because we created the word yeah. of God. Yeah. And now it's our job to act out what it is we think God yeah. is. Yeah. I'm a big fan of Jesus too. I'm sorry that they killed him, but they, 
I am. But they kill people. I'm going to help you out. Wait, can you turn your head toward us? I'm sorry. Is that okay? I'm sorry. I think that might do it. That's good. Be good. You sound good. If there's a way to mess up, I usually do. But what we have to understand is that people didn't just go out to die. They went out to live. And you and I have to live. And I think it's so important, I think it's incredibly important coming up that we vote. I think it's incredibly important that we register to vote. I know that some of us are... In I do. Yeah, one of the reasons, I know some of us are in prison, and I know one of us, one of the reasons we're in prison is that they don't want us to be able to vote. But I don't see what being in prison has to do with the fact that you're still a citizen, you should vote. Yeah. And you should be allowed to vote. It's incredibly, yeah. incredibly important. And as we all know, because we've seen what happened with the jury turning around, the jury keeps on, the jury says no, the jury says no. Well, the way that we get juries is through the voters' roll. And so it becomes in incredibly important that you're on the roll and that you become a part of what's on the jury. Because that's just, and they're going to say, well, you're prejudiced, but white people are prejudiced, and that's sort of okay. It's okay when they turn white people, no, it's true. When they let white people free, that's okay. But if we let black people, if we find them guilty, it's because we're colored. Give me a break. <laughs> they, no, they're guilty because they shot an unarmed person. Yeah. And it's time that that stopped, and it's time that somebody holds them accountable for that. You know, I mean, Nikki, when I'm, when I'm not on stage at Rockefeller Chapel, uh, I think a lot about uh, friends of mine when I go to Aspen, Colorado, and we're hanging out, and they ask me if I would like a little bit of marijuana, and I always decline, <laughs> just so you know. Uh, and then, and because there's a kind of, uh, it's, it's legal there. And then I think about my nephews here in Chicago who uh, are struggling to find a job, trying to make a living, trying to hustle, maybe get caught up, got a dime bag on them, uh, and then end up in a system that will not let them go, right? And that there's a way in which the kind of offense, uh, it's an offense here, and it's a billion dollar industry on the west, west side of the country. And, and that they're, they're, it's hard not to imagine that things like that aren't systematic, that, that, they're, that they're not set up in a real attempt to kind of uh, take you out of the voter registration role. Well, I have, I have a problem with pot. I don't, I don't do drugs. But my problem with marijuana is that you can grow it. You can actually take a seed and put it in a pot, and you can grow it. And I think anything you can grow in your living room, you ought, it ought to be legal. Yeah. But I also, don't you? I mean, you can grow pot. Everybody knows that. But the problem that I have with drugs is that drugs are like tobacco. Yeah. Tobacco is legal. Of course, what we've done now is we prevent you from doing it any place. But, and I used to smoke, and it's not a good idea, by the way. Don't smoke. <laughs> and the reason you shouldn't smoke is, to me, is very yeah. clear because I ended up with lung cancer. And I'm very lucky because I'm still here. Yes. They took my left lung out. Yeah. They did. They took the left lung out. That wouldn't normally matter except that I want to go in space. And I had the pleasure of having lunch with uh, uh, Director uh, Bolden. And we were talking. Uh -huh. I said, you know, we need to send some writers into space. I said, you know, somebody like me. And he said, Dr. Giovanni, we can't send you into space. And I said, why? You know, <laughs> I know I'm old, but <laughs> other than that, why? And he said, because you are missing a lung. We can take you into space, but if we bring you back, your organs will move around, and it end up your stomach could be over there, and it'll kill you. So I have actually made a deal with Dr. Bull, <laughs> with, with, with Mr. Bull. <laughs> As we all know, and it's sad to me, believe me, I'm not going to live forever, neither is anybody else. So. My family doesn't live, the Giovannis are all dead. I'm 72 years old, the Giovannis are gone. But the Watsons, my mother's side of the family, live a long time. I figure I've got a good maybe 80 years. So somewhere around my 80th year, what I want to do is to be sent to Mars. Then I won't have to come back because I'm going to die anyway. And when I do, <laughs> in the meantime, I can get to write the poetry and stuff. And when I'm gone, they can just throw me out and you all can look up and say, oh, there goes Nikki. Yeah, <laughs> Don't you think that works? But that's why you shouldn't smoke. But the rest of this stuff, <laughs> but the rest of it, it, it's crazy that we keep making these things 
illegal. Yeah. Because drugs are like anything else. If we want to control them, the best way to control anything is to legalize it and then keep charging for it. Yeah. <laughs> you know that's true. Yeah. That's cynical, yeah. but you know it's true. I, I really want to talk about poetry in a, in, a, in a direct way. Before I do that, this morning my colleague, Dr. Jackie Stewart, who I think is here, she knew that I probably wouldn't be prepared and she reached out and sent me a, 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 a note on YouTube of you doing uh, an interview with Muhammad Ali, right? And it was this beautiful moment when um, Muhammad was young, you were young, right? And, and you, you just asked him, you know, I don't want to talk about sports. Just, just want to know how you're doing. How's your life? How's your life? My life is uh, good. I'm alive. I got up on the right side of the dirt. Yeah. And I tell you what I loved about Ali, and what he taught, we were talking about teaching. Yes. And I think we all teach and we all need to remember that we teach. But what Ali taught us is that you cannot be afraid. And he was drafted, as you know, into the Vietnam War. And he said, I'm not going. Yeah. And they said, oh, you know, if you don't go, we're going to strip you of your title. And he said, I don't care what you strip me of. Yeah. I'm not going. They stripped Ali of his title. And this is where I'm so pleased with me, actually because uh, we had, I had a friend who knew him and he, Ali needed to do something. He had children, he had a wife, and he wanted to speak. And I was asked, would you be afraid to go on a, a speaking tour with Ali? And I said, you gotta be kidding. I mean, I, no, yeah. because all the, what could they strip me of? I don't do, I, I'm not pretty, I'm not, I don't sing, you know, I'm not friendly. There's nothing strip me of. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing, nobody can take of me. So I'm not afraid of anything. Yeah. Yeah. And I've never learned to be afraid of anything. And I would, I would urge you, do not be afraid. Because the minute you let other people tell you who you are and what you should be doing is crazy. Yeah. So I went on tour yeah. with Ali. Yeah. It was wonderful. It was just, yeah. it was wonderful. There's nothing you can take away from me. Yeah. I would love to, of course, be Serena Williams today. Oh, don't you, weren't you so happy that she yeah. was the, the sports person of the year? She, she, yeah. yeah. It was the right thing. You know, I have a bunch of poems here. I mean, I figure, like, if you ain't going to read none, I can read one or something <laughs> on our way out. Uh, you have a poem, Love Is. I'm going to read to you guys. Some people forget that love is uh, tucking in and kissing you goodnight. No matter how young or old you are, some people don't remember that love is listening and laughing and asking questions, no matter what your age if you recognize that love is commitment, responsibility, no fun at all, unless love is you and me. Yeah. Yeah, I'm falling in love all the time. I do fall in love all the time. But I also know, I'm, as I said, I'm 72. So this won't do any of you all any good because you'll fall in love. But at my age, or a little, right, actually about 20 years ago, I realized love is a commitment. And it's a decision that you make about how you're going to live your life. And I think, I think that's important. I'm, I'm actually uh, really happy. Yeah. I'm glad that uh, I'm not as well as I would like to be, and that's the truth. I'm yeah. at my age, you're not. So, you know, you walk a little slower, and people come up to you and say, do you remember something you don't remember? You don't remember them, let alone what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that, that, that's the price you pay for, for growing old, and you can't blame yourself for not remembering because right. you didn't remember them 20 years ago, but you don't tell them that either. Yeah. And, what I like about my poetry is that I've never been afraid to write yes. what I wanted to write. And I have a student whom I love so much. I, he's, he's just a sweetheart, Kwame Alexander, who this year won the uh, Newberry uh, Award. I was so yeah, proud. Yeah. yeah, the crossover, yeah. And Kwame came by the house the other day just to check on, he checks on me because I'm at the age of people need to check on me. And so he checks on me, and how are you really doing? I said, Kwame, I'm doing okay. And he's like, well, I'm not, you know, really sure you are. And I said, I think the main thing that, that has made me feel good about myself, and I think that's important. And again, I'm looking at the choir. Many of us in this room are too young to feel good about themselves, because you, you know, you, you're at that age, you're just nervous. But many of us in this room, that's the truth. That's the trouble with being a teenager. Many of us in this room have to know now, I've done a good job. Mm -hmm. And I was saying to Kwame, well, I feel good about what I've done. He said, well, you know, I have to tell you, without you, I couldn't have been free to do what I did. Yes. He said, I learned to write because I never wanted, I never cared what other people thought about it. 
So when he wrote The Crossover, which is the first hip-hop novel, and The Crossover is wonderful, and I'm glad he won. It's the first hip-hop novel. And he said, everybody told me I couldn't do it, and I just thought about you. And I knew what you would say. And I would say, what the hell, right? And you, who are these people that are telling you if they knew what to do, they would be doing it? The hell yeah. with them. You go on, and, excuse me. Is this a chapter? You're, you're okay. You're okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> but you, you, it has a sense of hell. You, you go ahead and do what it is that you believe in. Yeah. Because only person, you're your first reader. Yes. If you're writing, you're your first reader. If you're singing, you're your first audience. No yes. matter what you're doing, you're your first. And people who get to be my age have to remember we're our last. Yeah. We're, we are the people that, we're the last people we're going to be talking to. And at some point, if we're lucky, David Bowie did, we're just going to fall asleep and we're just going to drift away and transition into another world. I'm a fan of the transition. I think that we, we look at death wrong yeah. because we know that it's a part of what happens. It, it's a part, it, it is the transition. We were born, we were in this womb, and no matter what anybody tells you, for the women in the room, I don't care what they say about childbirth, it hurts. <laughs> Keep that in mind, it does. You need good drugs in order to have a baby, and many of us know that. But you were in the womb, and then you came out, so you transitioned. And then you didn't have any teeth, you didn't have any hair, you couldn't talk, you couldn't do anything, but you transitioned, and you became grown, and then you became grown up. And then you're gonna transition into something like me, and you're gonna transition beyond that. And we have to approach it all with the love of the change, because change is all that, that's all we have. And that's why, again, I hate to say it, I don't hate to say it, I'm proud of it. That's why black people are so important, because we have been the people who have been willing to make the changes that are necessary to take us forward. Yes. That's, that's why I recommend being black. I, I, I urge you. <laughs> well, you know, Nikki, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, the fact that we're celebrating King today and that so much of what King did were these amazing speech acts that kind of changed the world. And I think that in your, in your way, your poetry has given us other kinds of freedoms, um, the freedom to be creative, to be our best selves, to be our blackest selves, to be our most human selves. And for that, I want to say thank you and I love you. And I think on behalf of this chapel, we all thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. <laughs>
please join us, for we shall overcome. We shall Thank you. As they take their seats, would you join me in thanking once again the Chicago Children's Choir under the direction of the phenomenal Josephine Lee. Wow, there's more to come. It is now my pleasure and honor to introduce our keynote speaker for the evening, Dr. Van Jones. 
Many of you may know Van as a political commentator on, and political contributor on CNN. He regularly appears across the network's programming and particularly with special political coverage. But Van has perhaps made his mark more importantly by not only being engaged in social and environmental justice, but in founding and leading social enterprises, building institutions to not only carry on the work, but to train and pass along that work to others. He has founded the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights, which promotes criminal justice reform, Color of Change, which works for racial fairness through its one million members, Rebuild the Dream, a 21st century think tank that champions innovative solutions to fix the economy and uplift the next generation, the Dream Corps, which promotes innovative policy solutions, the Dream Corps' major initiatives are hashtag Yes We Code, committed to helping train 100,000 low opportunity youth to become top level computer programmers, hashtag Cut 50, which is working to cut the US prison population in half in the next 10 years. and Green for All, which lifts people out of poverty through green job training and job creation. He was the main advocate for the Green Jobs Act, signed into law by George W. Bush in 2007. The Green Jobs Act was the first piece of federal legislation to codify the word green jobs. During the Obama administration, this legislation has resulted in $500 million in national funding for green jobs training. In 2009, Mr. Jones worked as the green jobs advisor to, Professor, to President Barack Obama. In this role, Jones helped to lead the interagency process that oversaw the multi-billion dollar investment in skills training and jobs development within the environmental and green energy sectors. And while he is best known as a pioneer in the environmental movement, Van has been hard at work in social justice for nearly two decades, fashioning solutions to some of urban America's toughest problems. He has currently uh, engaged in a collaborative effort with the artist Alicia Keys and in the midst of unprecedented bipartisan momentum, hashtag we are here, the social justice movement founded by Alicia, Alicia Keys has partnered with hashtag cut50 to petition Congress and the White House to pass meaningful criminal justice reforms. The campaign hashtag we are here for hashtag justice reform now focuses on the impact of mass incarceration on families, building upon Alicia's 10-year experience, working on groundbreaking, life-saving initiatives that have saved millions of children's lives. Mr. Jones is a Yale-educated attorney. He is the author of two New York Times best-selling books, The Green Collar Economy and Rebuild the Dream. As I said, he has not only led the efforts for social and environmental justice, but he has enshrined them, ensuring that young people and people all over our country are institutionalizing best practices, creating platforms for new thoughts and new ideas. We welcome him tonight as our keynote speaker for the 2016 Martin Luther King Commemorative Celebration. Please welcome Van Jones. Hey. Well, uh, first of all, uh, let's just have another round of applause for those young people. That was really uh, extraordinary. Um, also, I got a picture with Nikki Giovanni, and I tweeted it, and it has like 200 retweets already, so give a round of applause for the legendary Nikki Giovanni. Um, yeah, she says weird being old, and I'm sure y'all think it's weird being young. What's really weird is not being young uh, no more, uh, which is where I'm at. And to kind of see the next generation's genius, in the same space with a legend 
is just humbling. And um, very few things endure. I think that's what you figure out when you're middle-aged. A lot of stuff you're upset about, worried about, a lot of people you're upset and worried about, they just kind of fade away later in life. And very few things endure. Actually, it turns out only two things endure. Uh, Great art and the pyramids (laughs) in Africa. I say that because uh, Nikki Giovanni's poetry and her words will probably outlast most of the legislation that we worry about in Washington, D.C. It'll outlast the political and military conflicts that we're talking about. You think about today, people right now on the subway are reading Rumi. On the subway, they're reading Hafiz today. Children right now studying Shakespeare, studying James Baldwin. Uh, Great art, which touches the human heart, transcends cultures, transcends time. And that's why truly we honor Dr. King. I think we misunderstand Dr. King. I think we think about him as a theological genius. I think we think about him as a political genius. But we fail to honor him as the artistic genius that he was. Uh, most people are not willing or have not been willing to tell the truth about the, the great speech, the I Have a Dream speech. But I'm going to tell the truth about it. I think it's time for us black folk who know the truth about that speech to tell the truth about that speech. That speech sucked. I'm going to say it again. Because you think I can't say that and not get struck down by lightning. But that speech on paper sucked. Here's a true story. And it's important for young people to understand this. First of all, Dr. King was 24 years old in Montgomery. We talk about Dr. King like he was a thousand years old. Don't we? Like he was like 90. He was 24 in Montgomery when the women in that community organized, because it was the women that organized that, and went and snatched his little butt up and threw him in front of the cameras. So if it didn't go right, he could go back home to his daddy. That's what the Montgomery bus boycott was. It was the sisters. And by the way, Rosa Parks' feet didn't get tired. You know, we, we don't tell young people the NAACP at that time was a banned organization. You're hearing the music from South Africa. It was banned. It was illegal. You would go to jail. You'd get killed if you were known to be a member of the NAACP. Now you say, that's the National Association for the Advancement of Certain People. So you're not scared of the NAACP. But it was illegal. Where was Rosa Parks the summer before she got arrested? She was in Tennessee being trained by the NAACP as an organizer. She didn't get arrested. She got herself arrested. And then they went and got Dr. Martin Luther King's son. It was no Dr. Martin Luther King. It was Dr. Martin Luther King, Daddy King in Atlanta who had a little son who trying to get away from daddy had run up to Montgomery. So that's why they always say Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. See, if the dad was a big deal. He was just a little kid. But when he stepped up to the microphone, there was a musicality in his voice. He had been preparing himself from younger than you for what they say, a day such as this. And that artistry you guys are developing, you have no idea, young people, where fate might put you and what microphone fate might put in your hand and whose ear might be listening. And thank God Daddy King's little son approached the the microphone and when you you can hear it even through the scratchy recordings the beauty of his performance. 
You can't listen to nobody's speech over and over and over again like you can listen to Dr. King's speech because he's just one step from singing. And he had less than an hour to prepare the speech, 24 years old. Fast forward to when he's 33, 33 year old kid standing on the steps of the Washington Monument. Biggest protest in history in the country. Quarter million people. Now we do million people. Uh, when uh, 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 President Obama got inaugurated, well, we had two million uh, people out there. But at the time, a quarter million people, that was a lot of people. Biggest protest in history. And Dr. King was bombing. How do you know this speech sucked? Nobody can remember the first four-fifths of the speech. Because the first four speech, the first four-fifths of the speech was not I have a dream. It was I have a complaint. I have a critique. I have a very long list of issues about which I'm thoroughly pissed off. That was... Read the speech! He's talking about police brutality. He's talking about getting a, a, a bounce check from America's government. Insufficient funds. Somebody know the speech. Somebody know the whole speech. <laughs> the check came back marked insufficient funds. That's not a happy speech. <laughs> Do I have permission to tell the truth? It was written by a committee the night before. Bayard Rust and them stayed up fighting and, and, and handed him a speech written by a committee the night before. And he was doing the best he could with the speech. But that speech would have been quickly forgotten. But, as usual, shocking no one, a sister saved the day. Mahalia Jackson, standing three, four rows behind the brother, a true artist, a true genius, watching the crowd, watching the young brother bomb, leaned forward and said very quietly, tell him about your dream, Martin. Tell him about your dream. Why did she say that? Because earlier that summer, she had been with the brother in Detroit. And in Detroit, the brother had given a speech that was kind of aight. It was kind of aight. I mean, best ever in the English language, possibly competing with Churchill, but I think King gets him. Best ever in the English language. But he gave a speech in Detroit that was kind of aight. And he got to this point where he was trying to talk about this dream, and it, but Mahalia. Now, you can listen to that speech, too. I mean, it's all on the Internet. The Detroit refrain, the I have a dream refrain in the, the, the Detroit speech falls very flat, doesn't work. But Mahalia, she saw something in that refrain, and she just felt maybe he should try that one more, one more time again. They have to have in church. She said, Brother, tell them about your dream, Martin. And watch the video. He never gives the last paragraph of the speech. He, he pushes back and he looks up. And what you hear then is the greatest act of slam poetry in the history of the Republic. 
That's what you hear then. Art, poetry, genius, dare I say black genius, improvisational, not one of those words that your children be up here saying was written on the page. It wasn't written anywhere. It was written in the air. It was off the dome, as we say. Huh? Off the dome. And yet, here we stand 50 plus years later. I'm not good at math. It may be more than 50. Public schools. And I was on CNN, sir, 50th anniversary. Presidents, if you ever been to Washington, D.C., they have a plaque huh, on the ground where the brother stood coming off the dome. A plaque. And 50 years later, presidents, Carter, Clinton, I believe W was there. It was all right. Everybody welcome that day. I don't remember if he's there or not. Anyway. Look at the video, throwing elbows. Who can stand on the plaque? Who can stand on the plaque? Presidents. I was in Ferguson. And I saw something that haunts me to this day. And I, it haunts me mainly because we didn't put it on TV. But it's the point of my concluding remarks. I'm all for protest. Been in jail many times. Um, all for demonstrations. But demonstration without legislation lead to frustration. And at some point, we've got to actually do something. Because when I was on the ground in Ferguson for CNN, right before they announced that they were not going to charge this uh, officer, and we can debate whether they should have or shouldn't have, or that's a whole different legal discussion. That's really not the, the point of this observation. I was outside on the streets, it was getting dark, it was getting darker. 300, 400, 500 young people out there, probably about 1,000, 150, maybe 2,000 people, but 500 young people, just like these young people you saw. They had a look in their eyes while they were waiting for the announcement. And it's a kind of thing I've never seen before. I hope I never see again. If you can imagine, I've tried to figure out a way to explain it to people. If you can imagine, this is a metaphor now. If you can imagine, see, I did learn things in my school. If you can imagine a city block when there's been a blackout, pretty dark. If you can imagine a house on that dark street, completely black. But somewhere down in the basement, somebody lit a candle. How much light could you see from the street, okay? Just that much light. That's how much light was still in the eyes of these young people. They didn't have a lot of hope. But it was a little bit just a little bit, and you could see it. And then the speakers came on. It's like they have speakers here, they had speakers all out in the street. 
And the DA comes out and he basically says, I'm not charging this officer. Now these young people have been marching and marching and marching and marching and marching for months. They marched when it was hot. They marched, I mean, and they also, they had passed an ordinance. You couldn't stay at, stand still and hold a sign. So you had to march and march. If you stopped, they'd arrest you. And they had appealed to the world. And they were waiting to see, not are you going to charge the officer, but does anybody care about me? Does anybody care about me? Does anybody understand what it's like to be in a city where more than half the people have been arrested, where the budget of the city depends on giving people tickets and fines and tickets and fines and tickets and fines, mostly black folk. Does anybody understand what it's like to see your friend, whether he's right or wrong, maybe he's a shoplifter, fine, but shot down dead in the street like a dog and left there for six hours? Does anybody, does anybody care about me? And I saw when that announcement came, the lights go out. In all those young people's eyes. What we didn't show on TV was big, tough men, 22, 18, 23, with tattoos and grills, hugging each other and crying like babies out there. We didn't show people just hanging on to each other and just walking away in droves and droves and droves, just howling, crying. We didn't show that. We showed a few fools that went out and set some fires, and that became the whole global discussion. But I saw dreams die out there. I saw hope die in the eyes of young people out there. And nobody came to give them a way forward and we expect them to figure out on their own. And then if they don't do it perfectly, then we want to criticize them. Well, what's Black Lives Matter a legislative program, you know? What's yours? You want these young people to fix 400 years of problems that we haven't fixed. And so I come to you to say that we have a tremendous opportunity to be at least as good as a 33-year-old kid getting coached by a 45-year-old sister with no cell phones, no Facebook, no Twitter, but the courage to dream again. And so I, I take it Seriously, I invite you to, especially the young people. When a dictatorship goes into crisis, that's a good thing. It is a failure of domination. Huh? The, the armies and the, the spies and the security forces have failed to hold the people back. When a dictatorship goes into crisis, that's, that's a good thing. It's a failure of domination. But when a democracy goes into crisis, that's a failure of imagination. Huh? That's a failure of imagination, a failure of improvisation, a failure of innovation, a failure of the people, huh? To co-author history with each other. And that's what's beginning to happen again now. And the work to which I'm committed and to which I call you is simply this. It's not very confusing if you're a young person standing on the streets of Ferguson. I was in Baltimore uh, with a, a rock star named Prince. I went back to Baltimore with a pop star named Alicia Keys. It's not very confusing when you're standing there. It's confusing in the academy. It's confusing in Washington, D.C. It's confusing with the policy elites. It's confusing in the state legislature. But when you're standing on the streets, the answer is very simple. We need to close prison doors and open doors of opportunity for the next generation. That's all. It's simple. It's not complicated at all. 
It's not complicated at all. And so there's a new movement rising. There's a new movement rising uh, to take on mass incarceration. Uh, we were enslaved, and that wasn't just bad for black people, that was bad for everybody, because even if you weren't a slave owner, you lived in an enslaving society, which meant you had to put up with the dehumanization of yourself or other people every single day. Don't forget now, under slavery, what that meant. You say, well, I wouldn't have owned slave. Don't matter if you're white, if you don't own a slave. If a slave, an, ens an, ens an enslaved African ran off, huh? And another plantation owner shot that slave. You don't own either plantation, but you're white. You get called and, and paneled in a jury, not about murder, but to determine whether or not the taking of this plantation's property was a tort. Huh? You're a white juror. You don't own a slave. You don't approve of slavery, but you're a part of a society that will force you to vote on a jury. Well, uh, this man's property uh, got off his uh, land and this other person killed him and that was a taking of property. Does he owe him $100 or not? And you have to vote on that. Every single institution contaminated with a sick, twisted, despicable ideology that allowed the institution to exist. Slavery. Fought to get out of that. Jim Crow. Segregation. Well, I wouldn't have discriminated against anyone. Doesn't matter. You're in a society that if you sit on the bus next to Rosa Parks, you go to prison too. Doesn't matter. If you try to open your store up and say, I want to serve everybody, the Klan will burn it to the ground. And you know that. So you rationalize. So we fought to deal with that. And now here's the third iteration, incarnation of the same dehumanizing ideology, not enslavement, not Jim Crow, but mass incarceration, the worst of both, huh? If you, if you, if you, you don't have to call somebody the N-word, you just call them a felon, huh? You don't have to call them the N-word, call them a felon. They can't vote, they can't get a job. on the stock exchange today in your country, and you rationalize this. Whack and hut, huh? Congressional Corporation of America, private for-profit prisons that go up in value every time somebody goes to jail. These are private corporations, young man, that are valued based on how many of your sisters and brothers are locked up. They have turned the Dow Jones into a high-tech uh, 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 slave auction in your country on your watch. And so we rationalize it. We rationalize it. Well, uh, there are a lot of uh, drug dealers in the ghetto, you know, and, uh, you know, that, that's very, very bad, these, uh, these drug dealers. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, if they had jobs, they probably wouldn't be drug dealers. But, um, you know, it's, it's bad and they're breaking the law. And, and if you break the law, you have to go to jail. It's the University of Chicago. 80% of the student body, drug offenders. I'm going to say it again. University of Chicago, Yale, where me and Derek went. 80% of the student body, drug offenders. Don't get upset, parents. Don't let me talk about your country club. <laughs> Don't get upset, parents. Don't let me talk about your golf club, your yacht club, huh? 80% of the student body on any of these campuses, drug offenders, and not one of them go to prison. Hmm? But we rationalize it. And so now, 
you see a movement rising. Now you see young people, 24 years old, 18 years old, starting to march again, huh? Starting to speak, sound just like Nikki Giovanni. You listen to these young women get on the microphone at these Black Lives Matter rallies. And not just Black Lives Matter. Don't forget, you got the dreamers coming on. Huh? Don't forget you got I don't know more out of the Native American community rising. The dreamers rising out of the Latino community. Don't forget you got 350.org, mostly young white climate activists rising. Don't forget you got, you just had Occupy Wall Street rising. You got a whole generation now starting to dream again. Starting to dream again. Nothing more precious in the world and young people with clear voices, young people with open hearts, young people who can imagine maybe if somebody on drugs, maybe they need to get some help. They can imagine maybe if somebody doesn't have a job and we're in the richest country in the history of the world, maybe we could just give them one. Start to imagine maybe if you have an idea in your mind you should be able not just to be a downloader with an app. Maybe you could be trained as a computer coder. You could also be a uploader too and be a part of this digital world. Maybe, maybe, maybe. I have no doubt in my mind, young people, that somebody in your row or somebody in your cell phone Somebody in your generation, and it might be you, probably is you, is going to decide to put your love against all this hate. Put your hope against all this fear. Put your poetry against these shackles. Put your songs against this barbed wire, and if you do that, you're going to win, and we're going to win. You're going to win, and we're going to win. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, I hope you can hear me now. My name is Steve Edwards. I'm the executive director of the Institute of Politics here at the University of Chicago. Please, first of all, join me in giving another warm round of applause to Van Jones, <laughs> Nikki Giovanni, and Theaster Gates. All three of our featured speakers tonight have agreed to take a few questions from you. We have a microphone placed here in the middle of the aisle. We invite all of you uh, who are interested. We have a few minutes for questions to come to the microphone. We ask that when you do, you keep your questions short and to the point so that we can get to as many of you as possible in this short period of time. Let me, as we assemble here at the microphone, let me just ask a follow-up question to both you, Van Jones, and Nikki Giovanni. I'm curious to build on this idea of hope and dreams and social justice. What was it that made this the path that you knew you needed to take in each of your lives? Hope and dream and what else? What inspired you to pursue social justice as part of your calling, as part of your life's work? I, I don't really know how to use any of those terms for me. <laughs> um, I think truth has been important. And um, if I can say it as honestly and as humbly as I know how, um, 
I am important. So the first person I talk to again is, is myself, and that's what I was trying to say to the kids. You're the first person you talk to. So if I think it's funny, I laugh, and then I'll share it. And if I think it makes sense, I say it, and then we throw it out. And There are things that I dream about. I guess there is a dream because I'm a, I'm a space freak. And I, I just know it's so important that we get writers into space, and that's what I'm trying to convince uh, uh, General Bolden to do. I'm, I'm trying to convince NASA to send writers into space, because we keep sending scientists, and they do the scientific things. But we need to send somebody into space that would just, you know, be nice. And I think black women, I think we need to get more black women into space and find out if there's life up there, because the people we keep sending up there wouldn't know life if... if <laughs> <laughs> so that was, you know, if that's an answer. I love that. <laughs> that's true. Uh, <laughs> and Ben Jones? I, I, I should have gone first. Uh, that, that's not, <laughs> that's not going to happen again. I'm going to go first every time. Uh, um, my, my father is uh, Willie Anthony Jones, uh, and uh, my mother is Loretta Jones, and they were both uh, born in Tennessee, and my father was born in abject poverty. I'm a ninth, I'm a ninth generation American. What you doing? Sorry about that. <laughs> I got this. Yeah, I spent a lot of time in Oakland. I'm loud, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, my, my um, I'm, a ninth, I'm a ninth generation American. I'm a ninth generation American. I've been here longer than pretty much anybody in this room, my family. Uh, I'm the first person in my family born with all my rights recognized by this government. Uh, I was born in 1968. Uh, they passed, they finally you know, signed a significant stuff in 64, 65. My cousin Kenya, born in 65 before Johnson signed the bill. I'm the first person in my family born with all my rights. So when you, in nine generations, so when you, they stopped bringing us here, by the way, in 18, you know, 40s, 50s, so, you know, we've been here. Um, so you say, well, geez, you know, uh, we passed civil rights stuff, you got a black president, why don't you guys get your act together? I mean, it's been a very, very short period of time. And I was very clear, and my father was very clear, uh, that, this is a collective effort. So there's never any question in my mind um, that whatever I was able to do, I was doing because other people had just literally opened the doors for me. Um, I was integrating my elementary school. I was, uh, I had a minority scholarship to try to integrate a public school in a public college, University of Tennessee at Martin uh, in Tennessee. Um, so, uh, and I'll just say one more thing too. Like many people in this room, uh, I mean, I just gotta. My, you guys seem kind of weird. <laughs> just kind of strange people in general. Uh, you could be doing other things tonight, um, and you don't know why you care. You don't know why you, it bothers you. Most of you have been weird your whole lives. You're little kids, and another kid would get bullied and you would be upset. You couldn't see a dog kicked in the neighborhood even if it wasn't your dog. Most of you guys have been weird your whole lives. And we need to claim that, that, there, that there, there are people in this world who have big hearts. And we get told that that's wrong. And you should be more practical and, and no. Uh, we need people like us to have the kind of courage that uh, Nikki Giovanni has. So I, I, I don't know why I'm like this. It wasn't a choice. I was born this way. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, good evening. I had, uh, I wanted to know if uh, Ms. Giovanni would mind just uh, sharing a little bit, it's a short poem, of uh, Nikki Rosa. I think it's such an appropriate uh, piece of work for tonight, if you don't mind. You want me? <laughs> Please. Um, childhood remembrances are always a drag if you're black. You always remember things like living in Woodlawn with no inside toilet 
And if you become famous for something, they never talk about how happy you were to have your mother all to yourself and how good the water felt when you got your bath from one of those big tubs that folk in Chicago barbecue in. And somehow, when you talk about home, it never gets across how much you understood their feelings as the whole family that attended meetings about Hollydale. And even though you remember, your biographers never understand your, your father's pain as he sells his stock and another dream goes. And though you're poor, it isn't poverty. And though they fought a lot, it isn't your father's drinking that makes any difference. But only you and, and your family are together and everyone is unhappy. <laughs> uh oh, I, and uh, even the, I, I, I can't remember. <laughs> I need to, I mean, I, I mentioned, but I'm just going to, it's something I have to own and it's something I'm dealing with, that's okay. I had a, um, like a, a seizure last February, and they haven't allowed me to drive since last February, because seizures are things that, you know, you don't remember things. So anything that I remember, I'm always really sort of glad that I do, but I forget, I really do forget a lot. And I keep telling my students, because I, I teach, thank God, but one day I know that they're going to have something called the Giovanni Syndrome, because I'm taking, well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, you know, once I'm dead and gone, they, you know, you get all these things when you're gone. But I am taking my Dilantin and I do my pills, and the sad part is, that of course, I can't drink. I was mentioning I don't do drugs, but I do wine. And you can't do wine if you're doing Dilantin. And there are days that I wonder, hmm, do I really want to remember or would I rather have a really good red? So, <laughs> I apologize for that. I'm just doing the best I can. Thank you. That's awesome. So, first of all, thank you for coming to the south side of Chicago. We really needed you. Did we need them? We need them today. Thank you so much. Um, so a couple of things that I think have become obvious in the Black Lives Matter work we've seen here and many of us are doing here is that there's a couple of divides in our community. And I want to know if you think we really have a chance to bridge these at this point. And I'm talking about, one, the generational divide you know, those of us who are post-civil rights, not looked at as the ones who have paid their dues enough. And the other is the brothers versus the sisters. You know, because as you said, Van, Black Lives Matter has been built by the women. So can we, can we deal with those now? You think we can deal with those now? Is this the moment? You said you <laughs> tell, tell me how, tell us how we deal with them now. I'm sure going first. <laughs> Uh, I, I have no idea. I just grabbed a microphone like most men. Um, so, <laughs> um, well, I'll speak to the generational piece. Um, I was a part of the so-called hip hop wave. So you have the civil rights folks, you have the hip hoppers, now you have Black Lives Matter. So I'm in the middle of this sandwich. And I think that the younger people once you're younger than I am, more that age, I think they actually feel more self-confident. Uh, they have basically grown up knowing more than their parents about at least technology. And so they, there's this interesting kind of dynamic where from little kids, they were like, they had to like fix the VCR, right? From little kids, they had to be like help them on with the computer. And so there's a little bit they don't seem to me to be, seem to my eyes to be as freaked out about this generational stuff as my generation was. We were right in the shadow of these civil rights giants and we felt like they just wanted us to go be their interns. And I'm like, I'm 32. I'm kind of old to be an intern. Can I have some kind of something? And so, uh, what we did, we just, at least in the Bay Area, we just went out and built our own stuff. And I just, Nobody's going to hand you a leadership baton. You just start leading, and eventually people respect it. And what I will say is this. If there's some unmet need, emotional, psychological, spiritual, that you bring into political work, it's not going to be met. It won't be. When you're doing political work, you're the point of the fulcrum. In other words, the change has to happen to some extent at your expense. 
And what makes that possible is not how sharp your point is, but how deep your base is, right? How strong your base is. And we are always trying to be sharp, but we don't always try to be deep. I would encourage people, like just if you're resting on your own base of knowledge, of resources, of insight, of commitment, you don't need to be affirmed by somebody 20 years older or 20 years younger. And I see a lot of people trying to get their needs met in this work, which is supposed to be trying to get the people's needs met in this work. I was going to say, did that answer? I, because I'm 72, so I'm, my son is 46. I think that the thing that I like about the generation, the, 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 the your generation, is that you are doing what you believe in. And I like the fact that, that you all do a lot of things. I look at the athletes now, and I'm really so proud of them, that we have athletes that are going to Haiti, we have people that are going to Ghana, that are going abroad, that are doing things that they think is important. And I think that it's important that the young people do, do things that they think is important. And I think it's important that we continue to do things that we think are important. I am, as you know, he and I disagree, you know, about Obaco, uh, that, that boy in the White House. We disagree about that. And, Basically, we, young man, excuse me, and basically, we probably aren't seeing eye to eye on where we're going. I don't think it's my job as a 72 year old to tell Black Lives Matter what they should do. I am disappointed in the church because I think the church has become too financial and has not gone into doing what it should be doing, which is to keep, keep, keep us up, you know. And, and I wish everybody, I wish them well. I know that the two things, that I know education is important. I don't care what anybody, I, the other thing I disliked that I didn't mention was Between the World and Me, a little stupid bestseller. And, and it is, if you haven't read it, good for you. No, because there's no reason, you cannot go through life being afraid of anything. And if my generation didn't teach us anything, it taught us that. If you could see those youngsters standing in Birmingham with the hoses coming after them and they weren't afraid, by what right do you have to be afraid of some damn cop or something now? You have no right to be afraid. We go forward. And I think that that's what's important. But I like black people. I think that we are, I think that we're good. And I think we do good things. And I think that the white people who identify with us are, are the right white people because they're not actually white at that point, are they? <laughs> they actually become black and we like that. <laughs> I, I want to be sensitive to our time. I, I just, you want to add one? Oh, she said gender, I didn't talk. Yes. Well, I, I've, I mean, quite naturally, I think that women are the best. I, I started off saying, no, where would we be if that woman in that slave ship had not started that song? Where would we be? So I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of women. I, I think that, and I think that women need to continue. I don't know where Hillary's going with this, you know, anything like that. But I know that it's a good thing that women go forward. It's a long line coming. Everybody's going to be mad at me if I keep this up. Thank you so much. We'll have uh, time here for at least this one question. I'll see what we can do, if we can keep okay. the answer short to uh, maybe one more. All right. Thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it, um, especially you speaking power to the feeling that I felt watching Trayvon um, acquittal for his murder and that similar feeling you talked about in Ferguson, the loss of hope. And so I hear you speaking on how... Uh, Hope in the American dream um, needs to be maintained in black people and the American public. But I wonder if the Black Lives Movement is really so focused in the media, at least, on um, uh, the military and, uh, sorry, not the military, the uh, prison industrial complex and providing uh, more opportunities in that sense. Are we not leaving out the dream aspect in terms of what it means for have more opportunities and equality in America, in terms of jobs, education? I feel like that's not really in the narrative, and how can we push that to be as big a part of the Black Lives Movement narrative um, in the media, especially for you, Dr. Jones, who are a representative for the media? Black Lives Movement is finished because we were a part of That's my generation. His generation is the hip hop movement, and they have done pretty much what they're gonna do. They've taken the jobs that we opened the doors for. The next generation actually is you. You're asking us to do something, but you, if we do something, then you'll just say we're doing it wrong. You need to do your own <laughs> Isn't that true? You need to do your own thing. Don't ask us. The no, there might also be this, this, um, this question about strategy. Like, 
you know, is it the best strategy that you would kind of constantly respond to the thing that's thrown at you? Or that if there's a kind of created crisis that you would feel that your only defense is the defense of the created crisis? That it requires another kind of self-invoked strategy that we have to decide that there are other things besides the, um, the kernels of defensiveness, defenselessness that we feel, and then kind of ask these questions like, what, what is the agenda? And I think that those conversations that are happening at our cafes, at our little speaking groups, in our choir rehearsals, after choir rehearsal, that there has to be a way that we could say, you know, in addition to those things that we need to defend and protect, that there are these other things that matter. And I, I keep thinking about beauty and the voice. And I keep thinking about relationship and like how important these things that could never be, uh, they're the nuanced things that keep the movement moving forward. They're not always the topic that's made for the media. And so it's like we have to stop being on the one side of defense and maybe ask ourselves, in addition to those things that have happened in Ferguson, what happened to matters of self-love self-care, self-preservation, loving each other, you know, you know. Let's take one final question here from this young lady. Yes. Uh, Nikki, can you sign my book? Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not a problem. I we'll will. have you come over here, yeah. young lady, if you don't mind. Yeah. And, we gotta get to the gentleman, because he's we'll frowning. Get, <laughs> there you go, sir. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jamil Mohammed. I'm an undergraduate student at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and this question is specifically to Dr. Jones. Um, you said that there is no content in protest if there's not also content in legislation. Um, and as a student at a very privileged institution, my question is, is there really hope in these sorts of institutional, fundamentally conservative ideas of how change happens? Is there really hope in legislation when there, like the civil rights, the civil rights bill is passed, but they come up with like a new and innovative way to like, do accomplish the same end. So I guess, can you speak to what hope we have left? Uh, what's your name, brother? Jamil Mohammed. Jamil, and, and which, which school do you say you, you go to? Penn. Penn, yeah. Um, are you uh, a, an activist on campus? A political scientist and an activist. And an activist. Uh, what year are you? A junior. Junior, yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for your work. Um, and, and most of us, um, yeah, seriously. Yeah. Um, and, and, and most of us, uh, who are up here start out doing exactly what you're doing and, and, and asking deep questions like what you're doing. Challenging questions is so critical because, uh, you are in a position where you can do that. Uh, and you can do that in a way that I think is very, very important for a movement. Um, I tend to be a both and kind of a guy. And it's not a dodge. It's just what I've seen work. Um, when I was young, I was on the left side of Pluto. <laughs> okay. Like if there were a solar system, like with a map and like, you know, the sun and, 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 and Pluto, I'd have been on the left side of Pluto with a pogo stick trying to get further left because I was mad about Rodney King almost 30 years ago. This dynamic between agitation and legislation, between protest and, uh, reacting to the worst crimes of the system against our folk. And then people who are in the system, like I am now, having more space to try to get some stuff done. I don't want you to mishear me. I didn't say that protest doesn't have content. I said, pro I said demonstration without legislation leads to frustration. That's what I said. Demonstration without legislation. And it's not your job necessarily to get the legislation done. I think it's horrible when people my age and older talk to people your age and say, well, where's your, you know, uh, you know, bill? You know, like you're not supposed to be writing bills. You're supposed to be doing what you're doing. But let me suggest to you something. The elites are in trouble too. The elites are scared too. It's not that they have the answers and just didn't tell you. 
It's not that your teachers have the answer and didn't tell you, or I have the answer and didn't tell you, or the president has the answer and didn't tell you, or the Tea Party or Trump has the answer and didn't tell you, or the people who are you know, leading the dictatorship in China, had the, or the people in ISIS have the answer and didn't tell you. People don't know what to do. The, the news is much worse than you think. It's not that the institutions are corrupt. They've been corrupt. It's now they're failing. They're even failing with what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to give more money to rich people and keep poor people down. Well, you see the stock market today? This whole thing is starting to creak. And so what I would say to you is uh, do both. You're going to live a long time, God willing. You're going to have multiple careers, God willing. So get out there and protest fully and learn what you learned from that. Put your body on the line in a nonviolent way and learn what you learned from that. Your body learns something different when you're sitting there looking at a police officer about to arrest you for what you believe in. Your body learns something different when you're sitting in jail hoping your homeboy got some money to get you out. Hoping you're not last on the list for the committee with the strike fund. Your body learns something different when you do that. And your body learns something different when you walk into a Senate subcommittee and speak and win. Your generation is going to have to do both and, both and, both and, both and. And the thing I worry about you guys is that there is now a virus in your generation called, yeah, but. It don't matter what you do. You could literally be Rosa and Ella Joe and Fannie Lou and James Baldwin and and shot in the street and doing everything you can for the people and somebody go, yeah, but you left out so-and-so. What does it mean that you left out so-and-so? You know what that leads to? People just stop trying because they feel like they are always going to be attacked from the left as opposed to yes and. What you did was beautiful and now let's. Right. And so I appreciate, I hope you can stay. I appreciate you. I appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate you asking the tough questions. There is a better way to be human beings. It has not been invented yet. And I'm counting on your generation to figure it out. We're now going to make way for the Dean of Rockefeller Chapel with a final benediction. But please join me in thanking all of our questioners, Van Jones, Nikki Giovanni, and Theaster Gates. Thank you all very much. Thank you again to our extraordinary guests of this night, Van Jones, Nikki Giovanni with the Asta Gates, and the amazing voice of Chicago, Chicago Children's Choir. As we close, I want to invite you to join us at a community reception directly over the road at Ida Noyes Hall. Please do come. And I want to invite you, each one of you, to find your own voice as a poet, an artist, a prophet, a dreamer, to love the world, to know that love is a decision you make, as Nikki Giovanni said to us, to know that this is a commitment to how you're going to live your life, to know that rebuilding the dream is a commitment to working for change, to overcome as we shall, to walk hand in hand as we must. So go this night hand in hand. When you wake tomorrow, Ponder again what you heard this night and live your days in courage to make the world a better place because you work here. May it be so.